right, everyone. So today's lecture is going to be over metabolic disorders, vitamin and nutritional deficiencies. And before we go any further, I just want to clarify that I am by no means a nutritional specialist. So when we approach these topics, we're going to try to look at them as a clinician. And I'm going to try my best to show you the most important things to remember for both my test and for your pants. Here are our instructional objectives. And here's what we're going to be covering today. So we're going to start off with uh, one of the metabolic disorders, phenylketonuria, PKU. We're going to move on to the nutritional deficiencies. We're going to talk a little bit about the protein deficiencies of marasmus and kwashiorkor, and then we're going to move on to the vitamins. Last but not least, we're going to cover obesity. So let's start off with a topic that we're really just going to skim the surface on. It is called PKU for short, phenylketonuria, and this is an inherited uh, error in metabolism. Um, essentially what happens is when babies are born, uh, they have the inability to metabolize um, the, the amino acid of phenylalanine, and so they have trouble uh, converting that to... Um, to tyrosine. So when you when you see a patient, it's going to be hard to make this diagnosis. But the most important thing you can remember is that newborns are screened for PKU. So most of this infants that are born here in the United States are going to be screened, and we're going to know whether or not they have this at an early age based on our newborn screening. Um, if they slip through the cracks or if they come here from another country. Um, it is also important to know that newborns do not display any symptoms of PKU because it takes a while for the phenylalanine to accumulate within them. So you'll usually see it kind of a month or so, a little, a little further along uh, as their infant. So what kind of symptoms do they have? Well, most importantly, neurologic. They have developmental delays, intellectual disability, seizures, and microcephaly. They have behavioral issues, social issues, emotional problems, mental health issues, and sometimes hyperactivity. Uh, they can also have low bone density. They can have skin rashes. And classically, how they will present in vignettes is having this fair skin, uh, kind of like pale, uh, lack of melanin. So both pale to the skin and even the hair, lighter colored. Uh, and they also generally describe in a vignette a musty odor in the breath or the urine. And if these patients are not caught early and the diet is not modified, they, they will result in severe mental retardation, developmental delays, problems neurologically and, and psych, uh, behavioral psychiatrically, and, and eventually can lead to death if they're not properly treated. And that's why it's so important that we screen infants. And that is also why I have here the heel stick, because when babies are born, they have blood drawn for several uh, different tests, PKU being one of them, and they do it as a heel stick. So it should be diagnosed on newborn screening. And if the baby didn't get one, they should get one. Uh, the best initial test to diagnose PKU is a, a plasma, phenylalanine, and tyrosine levels. What you'll classically see, and you should know this, is that phenylalanine will be high because the body cannot um, metabolize it, and tyrosine will be low because that is what the body metabolizes phenylalanine to. So if it can't process phenylalanine, then tyrosine will also be low, and those are important to remember for this. How do we treat it? Well, you can't cure it. Um, it, it is strictly diet modification and, and medication supplementation. So these, these uh, kiddos have to have regular blood testing. Um, they have a low phenylalanine diet, so getting rid of things like soybeans, chicken, shrimp, nuts, turkey, and legumes, and also avoiding um, fake sugars, so aspartame-containing products. Um, they have to supplement uh, for protein, they have to supplement um, a tyrosine and um, and a neutral um, amino acids. So they have to supplement that because they're not getting it in their diet as well. And then adults uh, can have a lot of trouble with this if they're not following 
their um, diet strictly. And so for those that have trouble as an adult, as a kid, you kind of, you know, you're feeding your child. So it's not so hard to give them what they need and not give them what they don't need. But as an adult, you have free reign, free choice to choose what you want to eat. And for those that have poor control, you can give uh, a drug called uh, Peg Valiase. And that helps act as an enzyme to help break down the phenylalanine. That is it. That is all you need to know. Uh, a lot of times when they present in a vignette, it'll be someone coming from another country who was, the newborn screen was skipped. It's usually a kid, very fair skinned with lack of melanin, sometimes with skin rashes like eczema, some developmental delays, and a musty odor of breath. That is PKU. Moving on, we're going to talk about two also pretty rare things. I mean, we really, really don't see this much here in the United States, but it is something that we should be familiar with, and the tests love to test on this. So it is Merasmus and Kwashiorkor, and they're two different um, nutritional deficiencies, um, and it's specifically nutrition, uh, protein energy malnutrition. And so I don't know if you've been watching TV, sometimes it's late at night, these infomercials come on where we see these poor kids, usually in Africa and poor countries, and we see the, the kids with the big bellies and the wasting, and we think, oh my gosh, you know, we need to donate money, we need to volunteer, do something. These are the kids we're talking about that have these uh, protein uh, energy malnutritions. They can be life-threatening. Essentially, you're, you're not getting the macronutrients, you're not receiving what you need uh, and they are, they are very similar, but they also have a lot of differences. And the main thing that I want you to grasp from these next few slides is, is the compare and contrast between the Merasmus and the Kwashiorkor. Um, they, in textbooks and in testing world, they tend to separate them as two separate entities, but usually in patients, when they present, they kind of have a little bit of mixture of both or manifestations of both. So just keep that in mind. And the treatments are similar, so uh, it's it's worth remembering the features of each one. Uh, but at the end of the day, when there's overlap and things, we're going to treat them pretty much the same way. All right, so here's the difference between the two. Here on the left, we have um, a child with Kwashiorkor. Here on the right, we have a child with Merasmus, okay? And the way that I like to remember it is Merasmus starts with an M, and so does muscle wasting. So that's how I think of here. Uh, Kwashiorkor, um, it actually is a, a term, I believe, from Ghana. And it means uh, second child, if it, when it's translated. And what the significance of that is that there in these, in these countries, when mothers have their second child, what happens is they have to wean their first child off of breastfeeding more soon than they should be. When they wean that the firstborn child off to start nursing the second child, that's when the firstborn child starts having uh, problems with deficiencies, right? Because not receiving um, nutrition from mother anymore. And so that's why they term this second child, because it's when the second child comes that the first child starts having these deficiencies. Uh, so here's some of the, a nice little comparison table. And you can see that there's quite a difference between the presentation of these two. So the Kwashiorkor child is going to have this protuberant belly. They usually have xerosis of the skin and edema. Uh, they, they, um, they are generally more ill. Even though they don't look it, they're more ill than the Merasmus children. Um, it usually develops between six months to three years of age. Uh, they have subcutaneous fat preserved. They don't look wasted like the Merasmus children. They also have some edema, enlarged fatty liver. Um, they tend to be pretty lethargic and they have a poor appetite. Um, and that's pretty much how they, this is mostly a deficiency in protein. Okay. And we look over at the Merasmus side, they're wasted. They have, you can see their ribs. They don't have any swelling, no fatty liver. Their, li their ribs are very prominent. And this usually happens in infants under a year of age. Um, and this is a deficiency in not just protein, but calories and protein in general. Uh, many times these kids kind of appear uh, alert and, and irritable, and they are still very hungry. And that's basically the major differences between the two. One other way that I can remember uh, Kwashiorkor is the, the acronym MEALS. 
M-E-A-L-S. So M stands for malnutrition, specifically protein. E stands for edema. A stands for anemia. L stands for liver because they have an enlarged fatty liver. And S stands for skin uh, skin lesions. So they have skin lesions rash. So that's one way you can remember uh, Kawashio core. So labs are essentially looking for these these problems with malnutrition, looking for anemia, um, looking at the basic metabolic panel and electrolytes and minerals, uh, electrolyte disturbances, um, thyroid function tests, the total protein, stool studies, looking for other GI infections. Uh, these these things. I mean, you're you're rarely going to see this usually if you go and do like mission trips in other countries and things then you might need to know this okay so management is pretty similar in both of them have to be really careful when you have malnourished children uh, that with refeeding syndrome and remember that we mentioned this in the pediatrics lecture for those that have failure to thrive uh, we have to be careful with refeeding syndrome we can't just you know put them back on this big diet right away because the body is not uh, acclimated to it and they will have trouble um, so it, it's a process that should be supervised and advised by a specialist that deals in nutrition of these type of children so the initial phase with these kids whether it is kwashio core or marasmus is a stabilization phase it's one week where you get correcting of dehydration you start giving them these ready to feed meals the milk fortified milk um diet a certain diet and you start with little small more frequent meals and kind of phase them up as tolerated you also treat any types of infections or electrolyte issues or any imbalances that come up so that's the first week then we have the rehabilitation that is usually weeks two through six and that's where we're giving them a lot of nutrition um, uh, milk uh, ready to feed diets and iron replacement and we're, you know, tolerate, increasing their size of their meals as tolerated. And last but not least, we have discharge after six weeks. We continue feedings protocol and trying to get them caught up with their weight. So refeeding syndrome, I'm going to touch on it really, really, really quickly. It's mostly um, pathophysiologic with this uh, little pathway here and how starvation and malnutrition works. But essentially what happens is... Um, it's a complication of those children that are severely malnourished and then we give them too much too quickly. And because, because of the, the way that ATP and ADP are, are formed in the body, we actually essentially get low phosphate or hypophosphatemia and that can put uh, children at risk for cardiorespiratory failure. Um, and that's essentially it, low phosphate. Okay, so you have to do it slowly. Here's some pictures. Uh, on the left here, this is the marasmus. You can see muscle wasting. You can see the, the defined ribs, essentially no muscle anywhere. Very, very thin, no protuberance in the belly. And here we have the kwashio core. We have the big, the big tummy, the swelling. Um, and then here's another marasmus. And this one's probably a little bit of a mixture of the two, but it looks more like kwashio core than anything. This is kind of stuff that pulls out your heartstrings. Right, so moving on, we're going to talk next about vitamin and nutritional deficiencies. And I just want to say one more time that don't get lost in the weeds. Don't get lost in the details 
uh, get the big picture for these vitamins because on your test for the for the QBanks that I've seen, it's usually pretty straightforward if you know what you're looking for to make these diagnoses uh, on the vitamin and nutritional deficiencies. Um, one other thing is as far as pathophysiology, I'm not going to go into too much biochemistry when it comes to these uh, vitamins. I'm going to stick mostly to clinical presentation. All right, so you know I love cheat sheets. Uh, we're, th here's a quick one that kind of has the major highlights before we get into the details. So we have our fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. Uh, and it kind of tells you quickly what to look for in vignettes that help you determine what the deficiencies would be for each one of those. We have vitamin C. Uh, and then our Bs, our B complex, right? We have B1, B3, B5, B6, and folate, which is B9, and cobalamin, or B12. So we will go through these uh, one by one, trying to highlight these differences, but I thought it'd be nice to have kind of a one-stop shop slide that had everything on it so that you can help remind yourself. So here are our fat-soluble vitamins. Um, they are absorbed in the small intestine. Uh, vitamin K is also uh, only, uh, only absorbed in the terminal ileum, and they are stored in the liver. So these are fat-soluble. They are hydro, uh, hydrophobic, hydrophobic. And they, uh, because they're stored, because they're fat soluble, they're stored in the liver. We, we tend not to see these deficiencies very, very often. Kind of takes a while before our stores are depleted. Um, but here they are again. And we're going to go on to the water soluble vitamins. These are hydrophobic, hydrophilic, excuse me, philic friends, friends of water. Uh, and these are excreted through the kidneys. Um, so it is. Um, not likely that we would see um, toxicity with these vitamin with these vitamins because uh, they don't they're not kind of stored except for B12. All right, so let's start with fat soluble vitamins. Uh, if you have trouble remembering which of the vitamins are fat soluble, I have two kind of little uh, reminder thingies to share with you. First is the fat cat is in the attic. A-D-E-K, right? Attic. So I put a little picture for you, found a nice attic here, and a fat cat. So A-D-E-K, fat cat in the attic. There's another one that's pretty popular with remembering, and I'm sorry if this comes across as insensitive, but we know that sometimes the more insensitive uh, mnemonics are the ones we tend to remember the best. For the sake of learning, I'm okay with that. So we have a fat, fat soluble vitamin, right? Fat, naked, A-K-E-D, person. On the beach, so those are A, K, E, and D fat soluble. All right, hope that helps. So these vitamins are, you know, required. Vitamins are essentially things that our body doesn't make that we get from other places, right? We get from other places and we use them for multiple metabolic functions, right? Just to keep homeostasis within the body. Uh, most of these cannot be synthesized by the body; they have to be ingested in the diet. So we'll see that there are some. Um, some exceptions to that and they're divided into the water and fat soluble we're going to be talking about fat soluble which are a d e and k uh, a lot of these um, vitamins can have deficiencies and toxicities depending on whether you have too much or too little of the vitamin and they are absorbed within the gi tract and either the small intestine or ter terminal ileum uh, with fat so we will also see that those that have trouble with uh, digesting fat soluble vitamins are those that have malnutrition type uh, syndromes where they have fat malabsorption. And in this we have pancreatic insufficiency, uh, cholestatic liver disease, celiac, Crohn's, short bowel syndrome. And if you remember, these are the same kind of illnesses that cause steatorrhea uh, because they're not able to absorb fats. And as you can imagine, if you're not able to absorb fats, you also have trouble absorbing fat soluble vitamins. So here's uh, a reminder of those that are having trouble with that. Let's start with vitamin A. I think all of us have heard about vitamin A before. Whether or not we're, we know we've heard about it is another story. Vitamin A is what we think of in the beta carotene, right? Carrots, uh, yellowish, bright colored fruits and vegetables. Uh, and they are good for our eyes. So that's why I have these two charts here. Uh, other, other things that we 
talk about with vitamin A, there's many different uh, forms of vitamin A. We have retinol, retinol, retinoic acid, beta carotene, and as you can see, retin, retina, right, for the eye, retina is in the word, right? Um, also, beta carotene, so it helps keratinize, and uh, I always think of beta carotene and carrots, right? Um, the functions, it helps with vision and specifically night vision. So when we have deficiency in vitamin A, we'll have a patient that has a notable night vision. Remember, retina, retinal, retina, right? Think about vision, eye. Um, it also helps with some cell differentiation, um, and it, it's involved in everything with uh, keratinization. So skin epithelization, growth, immune function, reproduction, and it's also an antioxidant. All right, so where do we get vitamin A? If you remember the picture on the first slide, think of really bright yellow orangey foods um, and as well liver and fish oil have it in there. Um, so uh, I think of carrots, right? Sweet potatoes, pumpkin, peppers, uh, red bell peppers, spinach, broccoli, those kind of things. The primary symptoms of deficiency are going to be generally related to vision and skin. So if you see a vignette talking about um, a, a patient and vitamin deficiency and they have poor night vision, it is vitamin A. As it's very easy. And they tend to make it pretty easy for you uh, to remember. Uh, it's uncommon to have vitamin A uh, here, uh, but like we said, those patients that have mal malabsorption are the ones that we're thinking about when we think about this. They also have dry eye and blindness. They can get hyperkeratosis, which is scaly kind of hair follicles that are more uh, bumpy. Uh, they can also get poor bone growth and impaired immune systems. So hyperkeratosis kind of looks like this, kind of like chicken skin almost. You can see all the little lumpy bumpies, dry and scaly. The zero ophthalmia is um, where you have these dryness uh, and you can also get these uh, lesions on the eye. Uh, they can get bateau spots, which it looks like soapy water, kind of foam-like patches on the eye from uh, keratinization. And then night blindness or nactalopia. And so what we would normally see, uh, normal vision at night, they don't, they lack, um, they have trouble with their rods and cones because of the, the deficiency. And so they see this. So they have very poor vision at night. And then severe inflammation can re re result in the keratomalacia and blindness in, in severe cases. Toxicity, well... When we talk about um, fat-soluble vitamins, there is a issue with toxicity as well. Um, it's kind of the opposite of deficiency, right? And it usually, you know, only, it's not very common at all, but uh, large amounts of animal sources of vitamin A, so patients that eat a lot of liver and things like that, uh, they can have that. Also, babies that, that are like addicted to carrot baby food and things like that. Um, some of the more... Uh, I guess vague symptoms, nausea, headache, vertigo, blurred vision, and it can be teratogenic if used in pregnancy. I don't know if you've heard of isotretinoin or retin-A. It's a treatment that we use for acne, and so uh, and it's essentially vitamin A, and so we know that high doses of vitamin A are teratogenic, so they're, they are harmful to the fetus. And it can also cause hepatotoxicity. This here is hard, kind of hard to tell, but she has sort of an orange discoloration of the skin, and this is called keratinemia. It's when patients, it's harmless, but it's when patients consume too much, too much beta carotene via, uh, usually via carrots or sweet potatoes, and they get an orange, orange tint to their skin. And over time, you wean them off of it, and the orange tinting goes away. And I've seen this in real life before. Moving on. So we talked about vitamin A, now we're going to talk about vitamin D. Now, I don't know about y'all, but vitamin A is not very common. Vitamin D is super common. Uh, I have pretty pretty severe vitamin D deficiency, um, and many do. So technically, remember we said vitamins are all kind of these um, exogenous things that we have to consume 
uh, well, vitamin D is different. It's technically a hormone. Hence, I have this over here, hormoni, uh, because it, it is it is also made by our body, right? Whereas actual technical vitamins are not made by our body. But either way, um, we can acquire vitamin D via the sun uh, and and other supplements that we consume, uh, mostly related to calcium and phosphate, right? So it has to do with um, absorption of calcium and phosphate from the intestines and helping with bone min mineralization and, and also kind of immune function, cell growth, proliferation. So um, the deficiencies, well, let's talk about sources first. So the primary source of vitamin D is sunlight exposure. So we're not talking about going out tanning by any means, and then we have high risk of cancer, but we're talking about uh, just being out, just having some sun exposure. So it's recommended five to 30 minutes of midday sun uh, every day. So that's a problem for us, right? Because we are inside on our computers all day long. So some of that has contributes to uh, problems with vitamin D deficiency. And I'm raising my hand right now because I have pretty severe vitamin D deficiency. Um, it's uh, not found in breast milk, so sometimes babies can have uh, trouble with vitamin D. Uh, and there's there's not that many foods that have vitamin D in it, although we fortify our milk and our orange juice, cereal, and infant formula. Fortify essentially means we put it where it's not occurring naturally to make sure that everyone gets it, sort of like how we put fluoride in water. Um, some of the groups that are at risk for developing vitamin D deficiency um, so those that have like milk allergies or lactose intolerance, they might not get it because they're not drinking the milk that is fortified with vitamin D. Um, breast, uh, breastfed infants, vegan diets, older folks, um, and then people with limited sun exposure. And it's, it's even more so in dark skinned folks. So dark skinned, uh, people because of their, the melanin in their epidermal layer, they, they are not, they don't produce vitamin D from sunlight the same way that light-skinned folks do. Uh, malabsorption syndromes, obesity has problems with it, and uh, chronic renal insufficiency. And so when we talk about symptoms of deficiency, the if we think about how it's involved in calcium and bone bone health, we can think that, that because when you have low vitamin D, you also have hypophosphatemia, hypocalcemia, and, and secondary hyperparathyroidism, which leads to bone demineralization. And so in kids, we see a defi with deficiency, we see what's called rickets, which is when we get kind of weak or soft bending and bowing of the bones and stunted growth. And it looks like this. It's pretty, um, pretty striking when we see it. So that's rickets. I believe that we will cover that more in the orthopedic um, section of uh, orthopedic module. And in adults, adults can also get vitamin D uh, manifestations in their bones. And in, in adults, it's called osteomalacia. It's similar to rickets, um, but they are at an increased risk of bone fracture. And you can see here the kind of the marked deformation of the bone. So all infants, to prevent this, all infants, older children, adolescents should be receiving the minimum 400 uh, international units per day of vitamin D. Um, and if you have a deficiency, you want to treat it immediately. Um, vitamin D3 uh, supplement, usually they'll give uh, a single single dose or they'll do kind of a weekly dose or daily dose of vitamin D3. Um, in, Ricketts is going to take a bit more to get patients back and they, they have to uh, do it a little bit over a longer period of time. Here's some pictures of rickets. You get that bow-leggedness, actually bending of the bones. It kind of like Gumby bones, right? I don't know if you've ever seen Gumby. Uh, but we see these in breastfed infants who are not supplemented with vitamin D. They're not getting adequate sunlight exposure. And it's usually in dark-skinned children, namely African-American children. Um, and, you know, they're also combined with malnutrition syndromes and certain medications. Um... And, you know, we get, have to get x-rays to kind of look and see what's going on and treat them accordingly. And we will go over this more in depth in the orthopedics section. 
Uh, well, if you can imagine that vitamin D deficiency leads to low calcium, then vitamin D toxicity, uh, consuming too much, um, too much vitamin D would have the opposite effect. Uh, we essentially get the hypercalcemic states, and that is, if we can recall back to the perineoplastic syndromes back with the uh, lung cancers, we talked about the stones, bones, groans, psychiatric overtones. If you remember that, that's hypercalcemia. That's what you can think of when you think of vitamin D toxicity or hypercalcemic states. Other things, nausea, vomiting, muscle weakness, anorexia, and the like. So that's vitamin D. Now we're going to move on to vitamin E. Um, uh, we are on the third of four fat-soluble vitamins. As you can see, vitamin E is found mostly in things that come that make oils. So seeds, nuts, avocado, olive oil, um, the nuts and seeds and things like that. Um, it is uh, has the tocopherols and the tocotrienols. Uh, it's antioxidant and it's only from plants. Um, it's kind of like the, the fat soluble equivalent to vitamin C and it's an antioxidant, a pretty, uh, pretty fierce free radical scavenger. So I'm not going to go into what free radicals mean. Uh, you should look into biochem and maybe some pathophys on that, but essentially it goes and it, it finds those free radicals and it binds them. So it, it that creates antioxidant effects, which prevent things like cancer and all sorts of things like that. Um, this is pathophys. I'm not going to go too much into that. Uh, but where do we get it? Essent essentially, uh, nuts, seeds, oils. And so I got our peanut butter jelly time guy up here reminding us that peanuts, oils, um, and fortified series are where we get vitamin E. Deficiencies. So it is super rare. I've never seen a question on vitamin E deficiency ever. Uh, but we can see it in those patients that have uh, fat malabsorption. And there's also a rare genetic disorder called ataxia and vitamin E deficiency, and they essentially look kind of like they can't walk. Um, they also get, you know, neuromuscular signs and hemolytic anemia. Uh, vitamin E is also used a lot on the face uh, for skin, um, for helping out with skin or good skin. In toxicity, um, I guess there is a risk of toxicity because it is vi um, fat soluble, but increased risk of a hemorrhagic stroke, and it also uh, antagonizes vitamin K uh, uh, and the vitamin K dependent clotting factors. So you can have bleeding risk, um, and you know it, it can increase prostate cancer. But again, it's not very common to have these things. Last of the fat-soluble vitamins is vitamin K. You probably remember vitamin K from your hematology module. Uh, we'll just go over it really quickly here. So vitamin K is consumed by our diet, and it's also synthesized by uh, our normal intestinal flora, which I, I think it is so cool. Vitamin K um, is actually produced by the bacteria that inhabit our, our gut, um, which I think is really cool, but the, the, the uncool thing about that is that newborns have uh, a sterile gut because they've just been born, and so they can't produce vitamin K on their own. They have to wait until they develop those, and that is why it's so important that we give vitamin K to all newborns. So what does it do? Um, it's essentially clot, clots, right? It helps clot, um, and it's, it's very important in coagulation. Essentially the opposite of warfarin, right? Um, it also helps with bone mineralization and that's about it. So dietary sources, we said mostly leafy green vegetables. So what you think of like collard greens, kale, I think of K and kale and vitamin K, leafy greens, um, soybeans, blueberries, chicken and things, um, deficiencies. If you have a deficiency in vitamin K, you can have trouble with blood clotting and you can have bleeding problems. So if you see in a vignette of a question and it talks about bleeding or bruising, uh, ecchymosis or GI bleeding, menorrhagia, hematuria, it's vitamin K. Uh, for diagnosis, you want to do your PTI and R and um, 
it's essentially the same things that you would do to monitor for warfarin. And you can have trouble with bone mineralization and chronic deficiencies. And again, more common in malabsorption. And uh, can also happen, you can also get vitamin K deficiency uh, if you're on broad spectrum, long-term broad spectrum antibiotics, because essentially what those antibiotics will do is kill off that normal gut flora that that synthesizes and makes uh, vitamin K. And so you'll get uh, trouble with the deficiency and, and some uh, bleeding issues if it's um, significant enough. And I have Popeye over here with his spinach and vitamin K. Uh, like we mentioned before, infants cannot produce their own vitamin K because they don't, they don't have the bacteria in their gut that help us make vitamin K. So we give an injection of vitamin K to every infant at birth to prevent bleeding. Um, patients that have uh, total parental um, nutrition, TPN, also need to be supplemented with vitamin K. Um, and then we have to kind of keep, of course, we know with patients on warfarin, we have to monitor their PTI and R to make sure that they're, um, that they're not eating too much uh, large daily variations of greens because that would essentially counteract the warfarin. And it is used to reverse poisoning also by uh, for rodents. And vitamin K toxicity is essentially non-existent. There has not been any established adverse effects with consumption of a lot of vitamin K. So just kidding when we talk about vitamin K deficiency. I mean toxicity. So we covered the fat soluble vitamins. Now we're on to the water soluble vitamins. And if you have trouble remembering them, uh, there's really only two, but then within the Bs, there's a lot more. So to remember the two water soluble vitamin complexes, I have BC before Christ, is you know, AD and BC. Before Christ, there was water. And after Christ, there was wine. That's essentially what I think of. Because remember, if you know anything about the Bible, whether or not you are a Christian or not, uh, you'll you'll note that Jesus converted water into wine. So essentially it's saying, B.C. there was water, after Christ there was wine. So B.C. is water related. B Vitamins B and C are water-soluble vitamins. If you don't need to remember that, you don't need to, but it helps me. So I thought I'd share it. Second is remembering what the heck all these B vitamins are named. And for the most part, we can go by B1, B2, B3, etc., except for folic acid. Folic acid's always gone by folic acid for some reason, and B12's by B12. But if you need a, a mnemonic to help you remember what the B vitamin complexes are, uh, you can look at this one that was created by osmosis. This really nice pet played by frisbee catching. And that would be this for thiamine, really, riboflavin, nice, nicin, pet or puppy is panth uh, pan pantothenic acid, played, pyridoxine, bi, biotin, frisbee, folic acid, 
catching cobalamin, okay? So I don't know how important it is for you to know the two different names. Uh, usually in the test, you'll have thiamine and in parentheses B1, or I'll just say vitamin B1. Same thing for the, um, the fat-soluble vitamins. Vi knowing vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, uh, that, that's good enough. All right, so these water-soluble vitamins um, are substances, again, that cannot be synthesized by the body. They must be ingested in the diet. Uh, the most clinically relevant ones are the B-complex vitamins and vitamin C. You can have deficiencies of these vitamins that can lead to all sorts of clinical manifestations. I'm not sure how they grouped all these B vitamins together because they cause such different uh, manifestations. But either way... Uh, most of the time, these patients cannot, don't result in toxicity because water-soluble vitamins, the excess is excreted by the kidneys. And that is why it's important when we advise our patients to take vitamins and, and supplement vitamins uh, that we tell them exactly how much they're using because sometimes patients think that more is more and essentially they're, they are peeing away the money that they're spending on these large quantities of vitamins if they're taking more than what their body can absorb. Um, here's a quick table of some of the more common uh, B vitamins, but we will go through all of them one by one. So let's start with B1. This is thiamine, and sometimes it's spelled thiamine without the E, but either way, it's thiamine. Um, and it is found, uh, also known as thiamine. You can remember these interchangeably. Um, a lot of times I see it written as thiamine. That's why I think it's pretty important. It, 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 is, it, it is one of the more clinically relevant deficiencies because we actually do see it here in the United States because of alcoholism. And there are two clinical syndromes that are caused by thiamine deficiency that we will talk about, you should be very familiar with, is beriberi and Wernicke-Korsakoff. So it's absorbed primarily in the jejunum and the ileum, and it can be stored a little bit in some of these um, areas, but it can't be stored very long, and it's very limited, and the excess is excreted in the urine. So we got Betty White over here putting uh, some liquor in her bowl uh, because we want to associate thiamine deficiency, especially here in the United States, with alcohol alcoholism, the alcoholics. Uh, it is found in whole grains, brown rice, meat, fish, legumes, yeast, fortified breads, and cereals. Um, like I said before, alcoholism is major. Usually the vignettes they have with thiamine deficiency have uh, some sort of alcoholic, and that is because those, those patients that have alcoholism tend not to eat a well-balanced diet and they have poor dietary intake overall because uh, they mostly consume alcohol and they can they can actually be deficient in multiple multiple vitamins and that is one thing that i want to really emphasize here is that if you see a deficiency in one vitamin whether it be fat soluble or water soluble you should look for de deficiencies across the board because most of the time we see one vitamin that's deficient we're going to see another one that's deficient as well um, other patients, especially those that undergo bariatric surgery, they have a lot of trouble um, maintaining their uh, nutritional content because they, are, they have malabsorption and they're also not consuming as much food as before. So we have to be careful with those. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so the way we treat these is we give them an IV um, and, and then oral supplementation. And then th there really is no such thing as toxicity of thiamine uh, because it, the kidneys rapidly excrete all of the excess. So m very, very important for B1. We're going to talk about beriberi and Wernicke-Korsakoff. We have to know this for the test. Have to, have to. All right. So thiamine deficiency it kind of splits into two major clinical syndromes, beriberi and Wernicke-Korsakoff. With beriberi, uh, it is rare, but we can see it. There is some infantile beriberi, and then there's dry and wet. So for our for our purposes, I want to really focus on the difference between dry and wet beriberi. Dry beriberi is an, a problem with um, with the brain, so neurologic problems, and these patients present with neuropathy, 
sensory and motor defects, uh, primarily in the distal extremities. They also have confusion, difficulty speaking, and they have involuntary eye movements, nystagmus. They will, you will see this in vignettes. We'll talk about an alcoholic that comes in uh, with uh, trouble, trouble speaking, confusion, and when you do an exam, their eyes are all over the place. Um, think, think, think dry beriberi here. Wet beriberi, on the other hand, and I think of as kind of the CHF, congestive heart failure picture. And I think of wet and CHF, they, they kind of go together for me. This is not necessarily CHF, but essentially what happens is it's very similar to that in that you get cardiomegaly, tachycardia, cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and peripheral edema. So it's essentially like CHF. It's kind of what it sounds like. Um, so they get trouble with their heart. Dry beriberi is brain. Wet beriberi is heart. And they can also have neuropathy. And you get overlap. It's not like, oh, I'm on the dry path. I only have brain problems. Or, oh, I'm on the wet path. I only get wet problems, heart problems. They overlap. Now, uh, one, the other thing I think of when I think of this is alcoholics are very, very sick. Don't be one, right? Be one. It's a B1 deficiency. So that's another way that I think about it. Berry, berry, alcoholics, B1. Uh, so dry berry, berry can also have uh, another manifestation called warnicky korsakoff syndrome. It's kind of a worsening of dry berry, berry. And it's Warnicke's encephalopathy and Korsakoff psychosis. And so Warnicke's encephalopathy... Um, it has a high mortality rate if it's not treated. And they get kind of worsening of that dry beriberi, uh, peripheral neuropathy, nystagmus, ataxia, aphasia, and confusion. Uh, and then Korsakoff psychosis is uh, chronic thiamine deficiency. They get, and, and it occurs kind of as a consequence of Wernicke's encephalopathy. They kind of go together. Uh, and these include a lot of memory uh, deficits and confabulation and so what you'll see is a alcoholic patient that comes in having trouble with confusion and you ask them you know who they are they don't know who they are they don't know where they are they're confused uh, they can't remember the past and they can't make new memories but one thing that's really interesting about uh, Korsakoff psychosis is that although they have uh, anterior grade and um, retrograde amnesia uh, they tend to confabulate a lot, so they make up, they make up elaborate histories, uh, and they believe it. Like they believe that it is the truth, but it's not. You'll have a family member next to them, and they're like, I don't know what the heck they're talking about. They they confabulate, so they can seem semi normal, I guess, if you don't know them well enough. And the other thing that's really really interesting is that these patients, although they have this retrograde and anterior grade amnesia, they're um, their procedural memory, so like things that, that you do kind of like muscle memory, they're unaffected. So let's say someone is a, you know, a, a truck driver, right? They would be able to kind of get in the truck, turn on the key, uh, start the engine, uh, put, the, put it in drive and drive because it's procedural memory. They can do those things well. They just can't remember who they are, where they were, and they can't make new memories, which I think is really interesting. Or like a chef. You put a chef in the kitchen, they have this Korsakoff psychosis, they don't know who they are, or what the heck's going on, but they can make an omelet because they remember the steps from start to finish. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, Warnicke Korsakoff syndrome, uh, eight, to, 8 to 10 times more in the alcoholic population than in general population. So if I haven't said it enough already, in your vignette for the pants, it's more than likely going to be someone that is either from another country or alcoholic, right? Here's some drawings of the different uh, deficiencies. Here's the beriberi, dry and wet beriberis down here. They have the edema uh, and the uh, right side of heart failure and things like that. So there's the difference. You can also get this Palmer rash. Very important, you should note you should know B1 deficiency, Barry Barry, and Warnicke Korsakoff. They will ask you something on that for sure. Moving on, B2. 
not nearly as important to know, but can happen. B2 is going to be found in, in milk, eggs, uh, liver, uh, green vegetables, and things like that. It's called ribo, riboflavin is its name. And the word flav, flavin, flavus means yellow. So you'll see it found in things like cheese and, and, and yellowish uh, flavors. I also think of like ligamentum flavum, which also means yellow. Uh, but regardless, if you don't have enough riboflavin in your diet, the symptoms are going to be usually in vignettes, stomatitis, chelitis, and glossitis. So having to do with the mouth. Angular chelitis is when the angles of the mouth become kind of chapped and cracked. Uh, stomatitis are lesions within the mouth and the buccal mucosa. And glossitis, it, it is what it says it is. It, uh, glossal has to do with the tongue. But I also think of glossy, like when you put lip gloss on, it gets really, really shiny, red, and irritated. And so this one's not very, very glossitic. But if you Google glossitis, you can see sometimes it's completely shiny. It, it lacks any bumps or lumpies on it, like the normal tongue has a texture to it. Glossitis doesn't have a texture to it. It's completely smooth and glossy, okay? They can also get other things like seborrheic dermatitis and, and normocytic anemias. Um, you can see it in vegans, uh, healthy, again, heavy alcohol use, pregnancy, um, and other, other problems. All right. Vitamin B3. Vitamin B3 is another one that I really, really want you to pay attention to because it has a, a syndrome of deficiency called pellagra. And we're going to need to remember pellagra very, very well. And I'll give you some ideas of how to remember it. So niacin or B3 is the, is the name for these vitamins, this complex of vitamins. And most important to remember from all this is the deficiency is going to be known as pellagra. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, you find it in meats, livers, fish, grains, uh, nuts. Uh, and so those that are deficient in niacin, again, we kind of see it in alcoholics. Again, alcoholics tend to be deficient in many different ones. Uh, bariatric surgeries, carcinoid, malabsorptive conditions. Think of the Ds. So pellagra. The D's being D for dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, and death. Although it's rare, it can cause death. So the main three that you want to remember are dermatitis. They get this rash. It looks almost like a sunburn. And we find it on the, the extremities, kind of on the arms, the legs, and kind of in the cape-like pattern around the neck, like, like you'd wear a cape around your neck. They also tend to have diarrhea and some sort of dementia or confusion. Uh, memory loss and so in the vignette you will see these three and death is pretty rare other things you'll see are like patients that have very limited diets so um, let's say patients in in countries where they only eat like corn or they only eat rice you know and they did they don't get enough of other um, you know, like white rice brown rice is good but white rice right and they'll have trouble with this okay uh, here's that here's that pellagra rash. It looks kind of like a sunburn. You tend to see it on the hands and feet and in the cape-like distribution here around the neck. All right, moving on. We are going to talk about B5. B5, if you see a question on B5, you have a cruel test writer because I have never seen a question on B5 before. But we're going to talk about it anyway really quickly. Um, you, you find it in shiitake mushrooms, and here's our little shiitake mushroom man, um, and a bunch of other things here. The only thing that I've ever seen kind of mentioned with this is um, like during severe malnutrition, like war, famine, patients get the B5 deficiencies, and you can get these things called burning feet syndrome, which I have a picture of here. Burning feet syndrome is like paresthesias and dysthesias of the hands and feet. Moving on, B6, uh, pyridoxine. B6 um, is going to be found in beans, poultry, uh, meats, potatoes, and bananas. And some of you have to be careful with isoniazid in treatment for TB. They can become deficient in B6. And those with impaired renal function, autoimmune diseases, alcohol again, 
pregnancy. And that's why it's so important that pregnant women take their prenatal vitamins. They have all of these uh, complex vitamins in there. Uh, for these, it, it looks similar to um, riboflavin deficiency. So you'll get a stomatitis, colitis, glossitis, dermatitis, and a microcytic anemia. So th they don't usually give you B6 and, and uh, riboflavin a, a, as choices, right? They usually give you one or the other, B2 or B6, because they can cause similar uh, problems. Now, vitamin B6 is one of the only water-soluble vitamins that can actually give you toxicity. Uh, and if you have too much of it, it can give you problems with photosensitivity, nausea, heartburn, ataxia, and neuropathy. All right, moving on to biotin B7. This is another one we don't hear very much about. Um, we, the only thing we really have to pay attention to is that high doses of biotin can kind of throw off certain lab tests uh, like t thyroid function tests and other ones here. So if you are taking a high dose of B7 or biotin, you should stop taking it three to four days before you have routine lab testing. Um, deficiency is really rare. I've never seen a question on this. Um, so I wouldn't get too into the weeds on this. You can just be kind of vaguely familiar with biotin. B9 and B12, you have covered when you covered the megaloblastic anemias back in uh, back in hematology module. I'm going to do a very, very, very brief recap on it because I know you learned it in, in more depth. Uh, but also important deficiencies, probably two of the most important deficiencies to be familiar with both for your test and for your patients, as it is pretty common. Um, B, B9 folate, uh, folate is found in foliage, right? Foliage, so spinach, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, avocados, um, nuts, uh, or sorry, peanuts and, and beans and things like that. Folate, when I think of folate deficiency, I think of pregnant, pregnant women and neural tube defects. We want um, to limit that also uh, causes, uh, of course, megaloblastic anemia, macrocytic anemia, and it doesn't cause the neuropathies and things as much as B12 does. B12, on the other hand, um, causes the same kind of stuff in the megaloblastic anemia. Uh, unlike the other water-soluble vitamins, it can be stored in the liver for months or even years, so we it takes a long time for you to develop a B12 deficiency. And whereas folate was found in foliage, right, in plants, B12 is found in, in meat, for the most meat and, and eggs and dairy. So we see the problems with B12 deficiency a lot in like vegan and vegetarian diets. So as far as the deficiencies, um, folate and B12 are kind of compared here. Insufficient dietary intake is probably the most common uh, cause of B12 and folate deficiencies. Can have trouble with liver disease, alcohol abuse in both of them, uh, pregnancy, anti-epileptic uh, medications and methotrexate, and celiac disease for folate. Um, also, something to note, which I'm sure you covered back in hematology module, module is for B12, there's also something called pernicious anemia, which is uh, autoimmune destruction of, of intrinsic factor, which can cause B12 deficiency. Also, small bowel disease, pancreatic insufficiency, and antacids can also impair uh, absorption of B12. So both of them can cause a little bit of neuro neuropsychiatric findings, but only B12 is associated with the spinal cord degeneration. Um, they can be asymptomatic. Uh, for instance, myself, I am. I just found out recently that I am de deficient in B12, and I had no idea. Uh, but once we start developing sim uh, megaloblastic anemia on a CBC, start seeing those, those symptoms of anemia, fatigue, shortness of breath, pallor, tachycardia, and changes in the hair and nails. can also get glossitis of the tongue. Uh, neuropathy, well, we know that's uh, kind of the tingling in the hands and the feet, uh, problem with ataxia, 
Um, and then psychiatric manifestations, depression, dementia, psychosis. And then in pregnancy, it's very, very important that we take our prenatal vitamins and get adequate supply of B12 and folate to prevent neural tube defects, especially with folate, uh, as well as all these other um, things. So how do we use folate? Well, folate's used to treat megaloblastic anemia and folate deficiency. I think that's a given. Uh, and, and it's in prenatal vitamins. B12 um, have to be treated with B12, uh, either oral supplementation or intramuscular supplementation. And the last vitamin on our list is vitamin C. So we hear all about vitamin C all the time and in immune function and and things and we also uh we don't see this very often we're definitely not dentists but it can cause pretty significant findings um physical exam findings when we're deficient in vitamin c although i i have rarely seen vitamin c deficiency uh in kids well kids love all of these uh fruity things they taste good they're sweet so we tend not to see it too much in kids uh, where we do tend to see it um, is kind of in the elderly population. And, of course, back when we had pirates, we saw it in that population as well. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Where do we find it? Well, it's mostly, you know, fruits. Um, we th- I always think of it as oranges, right? A vitamin C, right? Citrus fruits. Uh, other things like peppers and certain vegetables and things have it as well. So it's important. It's antioxidant. Uh, it helps with wound healing and the sense of collagen. Collagen kind of holds everything together, right, in our body. It's the connective tissue. Uh, and it, it, if you have a deficiency in vitamin C, it will cause a condition called scurvy. And if you've watched any pirate movies or ever seen anything, you'll note that pirates always talk about scurvy. And so we're going to talk about that for a second in a minute. Um, it has antioxidant properties. Uh, it was really common. So back in the age of discovery, when these uh, sailors were traveling across seas for long periods of time, namely like in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, they were taking these long journeys and th- these pirates or even uh, sailors would come from, would, would get this scurvy, right? These symptoms. And the name scurvy comes from the Latin word scorbitus which also makes reference to ascorbic acid, which is the compound behind vitamin C. Um, So the reason why pirates would be vitamin C deficient is because if you notice here, all of these items that um, that are the sources of vitamin C, they're, they're perishable, right? You can't keep them for a long period of time. And if they're gone for, you know, six months at a time, I mean, maybe citrus fruits will last, uh, you know, a month max. And then after that, you're really not getting any sources of vitamin C. So they would, they would not, they would not have vitamin C throughout those long journeys. And they would start developing, you know, the the missing teeth and the sores on the legs and things like that. And that has to do with vitamin C deficiency. Uh, and eventually, they kind of figured out that they could actually pickle sauerkraut, and they would take that with them and it would not perish. And they could use that as a source of vitamin C, which is pretty interesting. I don't know. I think kind of looking back at history and these deficiencies is interesting. Um, again, scurvy, what does it cause? The co- the thing about scurvy is like you would think it takes a long time for that to develop, but it can take as little as one to three months without intake for, for some of these symptoms to manifest. So we see delayed wound healing, petechia, purpura, ecchymosis, arthralgias, um, and they also have iron deficiency anemia. Um, again, we see it, you know, in drug or alcohol-induced disorders, poverty, institutionalized patients, or patients, kind of, this is a nursing home patient that had a vitamin C deficiency, and of course, pirates, which I don't know, plus or minus currently. Um, cigarette smokers have lower levels of vitamin C, and they require more intake. Here's some of the other findings. They can get some bleeding gums, petechia, splinter hemorrhages, joint effusions, anemia, and uh, parafollicular hemorrhages, as well as dental issues. They get severe gingivitis, and because they're lacking collagen, the teeth kind of become loose and tend to fall out. All right, so we covered all of the vitamin deficiencies pretty quickly, about an hour's worth of stuff. Here's kind of a at-a-glance chart that tells us the most important things, the most at-risk groups, and the, the findings of deficiency and all of these nutritional um, vitamin 
vitamin groups. So you'll see, remember, the night blindness for vitamin A, scurvy for vitamin C, rickets for vitamin D, uh, and, and so on. So you should definitely be familiar with everything that is on charts like this. This is what's going to help you get these right on the test. Um, if you just pay attention to the to the vignettes, you look for these things, you'll notice in the answer choices it's likely going to be multiple vitamins and you just have to pick which one is being described. It's not very difficult and you won't have that many questions, but you do have to be familiar with it. Here's some dermatologic manifestations. Here's that angular colitis and glossitis. This is from zinc deficiency. We didn't cover zinc, but it can cause this kind of peely rash. This is the rash of pellagra. And then uh, fatty acid deficiencies can also cause some scaling red rashes. Now that we've covered the vitamin deficiencies and nutritional metabolic disorders, we're going to talk about obesity. And if you've not heard about obesity, if you've been living under a rock, obesity is a global health crisis here in the United States and even throughout the world. Um, obesity is a big deal. Um, and some of the statistics that I read was, you know, up to 30 to 40 percent of United of, of Americans, like one in three are considered overweight or obese, which I thought was, wow, you know, striking. Um, essentially, like, I think it's interesting to talk about obesity because I think it's something we're all familiar with. And so it's like, well, I have to study about it, you know, but let's just talk about it a little bit. So it's excess body weight okay so excess body weight that gets um deposed uh or de deposed in adipose tissue so extra fat and like we said it's a global ep global epidemic it's a crisis uh and you know it has to do with what we eat our sedentary lifestyles uh and a mix of genetic and environmental factors okay uh, so how do we measure obesity? Well, the primary me method of measuring, which is somewhat controversial, is the BMI. So the body mass index. Um, and it has to do with taking your weight and your height and coming up with that. Now, we know that there this is not always accurate, especially for those that have a lot of muscle mass. But for, for all intents and purposes, uh, we use the BMI. We can also use the fat percentage to help us. Um, and the, that will also determine, help us determine overweight as well as the waist circumference. So those are three things that we look at. BMI is kind of across the board, the one that we look at most closely. Anyone uh, with a 30, a BMI of 30 or above, um, is considered obese. Anyone from 25 to 29.9 is considered overweight. And then morbid obesity is greater than 40 on the BMI. So... Like I said, one in three adults in the United States suffer from obesity, 
and that is up. So back in 1997, there was about 19% uh, prevalence of obesity. Now in 2017, 30%. That is huge. It has gone up a bunch. And so it's become way more uh, of an issue here and something that you will definitely see in primary care and pediatrics. Uh, and, and it's it's not something you can just give a pill for and it gets better. It requires a lot of coaching and many different methods to try to um, help tackle the, the problem. Uh, also, something to note is it's about 17% of children and adolescents are also affected with obesity. And um, of course, Hispanic population is higher, even higher up there, and African American. Um, I mean, we see a lot of obesity. Uh, where does it come from? Well, I mean, it's kind of common sense when you think about it. It has to do with uh, genetics, a sedentary lifestyle, increased calories, and not burning it off. So back in the day when we were cavemen and women, you know, we would eat, eat, and we'd have to fight to get our food, and we would, uh, you know, go hunting, and then we'd have to do a lot of manual labor, and so the calorie uh, energy balance was there back then. And nowadays, uh, we can shop online, have it delivered to our house, and we don't have to get up but to get the groceries off our front, our front porch and put them in the fridge and in the, in the pantry. And so we have, we have the less necessity for movement. Uh, we also, because we are blessed with food, we tend to overeat. We also like food, and we, of course, are conditioned to like high-fat foods because that's what our brain likes because having more fat means we're going to uh, be able to sustain our energy longer. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, there's a lot that goes into, um, you know, food and its ties to emotion and, and social and behavioral things. And so that's what can be so tricky about tackling obesity with your patients is, uh, really trying to have a very non-judgmental approach because a lot, for a lot of patients, food is part of their life. It's a very important part of their life. It's not just the calories that you consume to have energy. It's, you know, it's tied to our cultural connections. It's tied to emotional uh, connections. And so it can be very, very tricky to, to treat. Um, of course, sedentary lifestyle makes it worse. Uh, certain medications and things can, genetic conditions, underlying disorders, Cushing's hypothyroidism, and things can also contribute. Uh, certain medications, all of which are kind of listed here, can also contribute to weight gain. So there's multi, multifactorial etiologies that contribute to obesity. So we all know that obesity, associated morbidity, mortality and morbidity is with obesity impacts pretty much every single organ system. There is not one organ system that is, uh, that is free from damage with obesity. Um, abdominal obesity or abdominal girth so uh, is, is also associated with increased cardiovascular risk, which we will discuss when we talk about metabolic syndrome. It can affect your heart, you know, causing coronary artery disease, hypertension, cardiomyopathy. I think all these things we know, right? Respiratory, it can cause uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. It can make asthma and respiratory infections worse. And it can also cause the obesity hypoventilation syndrome neurologically are at higher risk for strokes and neuralgia parasitica, which is essentially when you have what's quote unquote a muffin top. So you have excess abdominal um, girth that kind of hangs over as a panis. It puts pressure on the uh, lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh and causes what we, what we have as neuralgia parasitica or kind of numbness or tingling or sometimes uh, ner nerve pain in the anterior thigh region. Um, it can cause problems with PCOS, um, macrosomic babies, stress incontinence, can have problems with skin, cellulitis, decreased circulation, uh, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. GERD is made worse with obesity. Uh, because of the excess weight, you get increased knee osteoarthritis. And, and it goes on and on and on and on. How do we diagnose it? Well, as far as history... Uh, Obesity is one of those things you can kind of see it when you walk in the room uh, based on the way that your patient appears. But of course, we can talk about with our patients the history. You know, what are these factors that are contributing to our patient's obesity? Lifestyle. What kind of job do they do? They sit at, at a desk all day. 
Uh, are they, you know, do they have manual labor? Are they up on their feet? Are they, um, you know, those things can, can play into it. Do they exercise enough? Uh, what do their diet look like? What kind of foods are they eating? Um, you know, ha did they have the other problems since they were a kid or did it start as an adult? How many weight loss attempts? I'll tell you the hardest part about losing weight is not losing it. Well, it is losing it too, but it's keeping it off, you know, keeping off the weight and, and keeping that ha healthy lifestyle. The smoking sensation, family history, you know, tends to have a genetic component to it. And then, of course, you want to rule out secondary causes with your patients, including medications and hypothyroidism, Cushing's, so that we can, um, you know, tackle the, the, the obesity in, in and of itself. Um, patients, that when they come into your clinic, will generally have a BMI calculated based on the height and weight. Uh, again, we said it's a little controversial uh, because like athletes and bodybuilders sometimes will be uh, put in overweight or uh, obese categories just based on a high BMI because of their, their muscle mass. And it can also underestimate individuals. Um, let's see, what else? Body fat percentage can be more accurate in muscular individuals. And then you always want to look at the waist circumference, especially in those uh, that have a higher BMI. How do we work them up? Well, you're essentially looking for manifestations of obesity and, and secondary causes. So TSH, looking for hypothyroidism. Your extra fat can be deposited in the liver and can also increase uh, fasting lipids or cholesterol. Uh, so you want to check all of those as well as a hemoglobin A1C and a fasting glucose. Goals of treatment. So we all know that managing uh, obesity is really tough. Uh, it is multifactorial and it's hard to keep off the weight in these patients. So we want to try to prevent obesity, treat it, and reverse obesity-related morbidity. Uh, if we can encourage patients to lose even just 5 to 7% of body weight, we can reduce the risk of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Um, any patient that we see with a BMI over 30, um, if they can lose about 25 pounds-ish, uh, they can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and overall mortality. So it is so important to try to lose that weight. Um, the first thing, as in any disease that we can prevent with um, diet and exercise and lifestyle modifications, is encouraging those lifestyle modifications. So changing our diet, uh, decreasing calories, um, uh, also kind of just making healthier food choices overall. We can, we can stress certain diets, uh, Mediterranean diets, low carb, low fat, things like that. Uh, but we want to give them something that is sustainable. Uh, we also want to increase physical activity. I think those are a given. Um, we want to encourage patients to make long-term changes, not fad diets that they're going to yo-yo back and forth. Um, and we also want to kind of focus on triggers that stimulate eating, you know, stress, um, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, patient education, we want to educate them about, some patients just don't know, you know, uh, you know, they grew up eating mom's food and they just, they don't know what is healthy, what is not healthy. So we want to, if we're having patients, we should refer them for, you know, dietary consult and things so that they can understand how to read a, a label, food label and how to maintain a healthy lifestyle. For as far as medications, there are some weight loss medications that are on the market that are helpful for patients that, that cannot lose weight. So those that have failed to lose 5% within three to six months that have tried lifestyle behavior modification and those that either have a BMI greater than 27 or a BMI of 30, uh, BMI of 27 or more with comorbidities like diabetes or hypertension, cholesterol, and those with the BMI of 30 without any comorbidities, we can consider these medications. So there's certain weight loss medications like fentramine and, and other ones uh, that you'll probably talk about a bit in farm. Um, they can help contribute to weight loss. They can help kind of guide or aid the patient in kind of overcoming that hump and getting things started. Uh, it is kind of controversial how long these patients should be left on these medications. Uh, and, you know, they have to be closely monitored while they're on them. 
again, um, discontinuation of weight loss medications is associated with gaining it back. So you have to be really careful when you put patients on these medications. Um, substances, uh, medications approved are, are listed here. Um, most medications uh, have been pretty well tolerated, and they do they have been shown to help um, help kind of jumpstart weight loss for patients. And a lot of times when patients can see the scale moving in the right direction, it is a lot of motivation for them to continue those lifestyle modifications. Um, we have the, the norandrogenic sympathomimetic agents. Uh, we have the amphetamine likes, which is the fentramine and all that. We also have some long-term use weight loss managements like Victosa or Orlistat, which kind of, uh, you know, take the, they take the fat out of, of our, of our digestive system and they kind of bypass it straight through the gut. So that you have kind of a greasy stool. And then there's a newer one out there that's FDA approved called Plenity. It's actually not a medication, but it's, um, uh, it are, it's some capsules that are given to patients that you drink, uh, 30 minutes ish, 15 to 30 minutes, I believe before you eat lunch and dinner, you take three capsules and drink 16 ounces of water. And these capsules, uh, come out, uh, they release these, um, these little, um, beads into the stomach and essentially fill up the stomach causing a an early satiety so patients get full faster and they don't eat as much and so it's called plenity if you're interested look it up uh, it's a newer medication out there it is fda approved and it's not an actual medication it's it's a treatment that's used uh, other things you want to consider are treating secondary conditions such as diabetes hyperlipidemia depression and hypertension so i would be remiss if i didn't mention the newer glp1 agonist drugs these are the drugs that have been prescribed more recently for type 2 diabetes associated with heart disease and trying to lower um, incidence of stroke and heart disease in type 2 diabetics. Well, they noticed that when these drugs were administered to these patients, that they had a pretty significant weight loss effect on the patients. And so if you've been living under a rock, you probably haven't heard of it, but a lot of patients over the last year have been using these drugs um, to lose weight and trying to find like a family member, a relative, or someone that they can get a hold of these drugs because they're very expensive and most insurances don't cover. And so the newest development in this uh, class of medications has been the rebranding of the uh, tirzepatide medication, which was called Manjaro, the brand name for the type 2 diabetic drug. It's been rebranded and renamed as Zepbound and this was FDA approved to treat specifically obesity this past December and or November. And that has been a huge breakthrough. I've seen a lot of uh, weight loss success in patients, uh, but it's such a new drug and such a new area of medicine that I think once y'all get out and get into practice, you'll start to see some trends and new research come out about these drugs. But I just wanted to mention them. I, I didn't think I could talk about obesity without mentioning these newer drugs. As a means of last resort, we do have bariatric surgery. And uh, again, some patients really, really benefit from bariatric surgery. It can be kind of the only thing that helps a certain um, group of patients. Um, it can lose up to 40% of baseline weight up in 12 to 18 months. The only problem with some of these procedures is, is the the way that you have to modify your lifestyle afterwards, essentially where we are cutting the stomach into a smaller portion. And so um, patients have to eat smaller sized meals. And sometimes that's really hard for patients because they're so used to eating food and, and enjoying food that sometimes afterwards they have trouble with that. So indications for obesity, for bariatric surgery are anyone with a BMI over 40, Anyone with a BMI over 35 with comorbidities, including these here. And anyone with a BMI over 30 would ha that have any of these um, uh, refractory to treatment and uh, the dysmetabolic syndrome X. And also you can, if you've had, you know, failure of multiple conservative attempts at weight loss. And these patients have to have a psychological screening and they have to undergo, you know, kind of a rigorous set of testing 
and um, counseling before they can have the surgery. Um, but it is the best means to cure obesity-related complications, and it, and it can essentially cure hypertension and diabetes when these patients lose the weight. Um, what some of the more popular uh, bariatric surgical options are listed here. Um, probably the most popular right now is the sleeve gastrectomy, uh, where they, they create kind of a sleeve in the stomach. Uh, the ruin rai is kind of the, the classic gastric bypass, where they kind of bypass the stomach altogether. Uh, and then we had the, the gastric banding and ballooning and things that, that have been used also. And that's really at the discretion of the bariatric surgeon, which would be best for uh, individualized patient care. At a glance, I think this chart is pretty telling as to all of the different manifestations that obesity can have in disease in general. Uh, you see it, it is affecting pretty much every system. We have problems with heart failure, problems with diabetes, cancer, gallstones, coronary artery disease, hypertension. I mean, it's across the board. And so I don't expect you to memorize this by any means, but we know that obesity is at the center of all of those. And last but not least, there is always an algorithm for everything. And this is a up to date algorithm for um, kind of looking at overweight and, and what to do kind of how to algorithm, algorithmically approach an obese patient. And I'll tell you what, down here in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, I would most of our patients are going to be overweight if not obese. And so it can be really hard to make time to address uh, obesity uh, on primary care visits, but it is something that is important and should be a goal of yours as a provider to try to address this. And it's one of those things like you can only lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. But it is your job as a clinician to educate your patients about uh, obesity. And, you know, you'd be surprised how many patients just don't know. They, they don't know how many carbs are in a tortilla. You know, they just don't know that. They've just been taught their whole life. You know, food is part of our culture. Food is part of life, you know, something we enjoy. Uh and, it, and down here and, and pretty much everywhere, we have big families, right? And pretty much every family gathering is surrounded around what we're eating, you know? So it's just very important to to be humble, uh, be non-judgmental, and have these conversations with our patients. Our, concludes our you know topic for today. Uh, hopefully we got the gist of everything. There are a lot of details that we discussed, but remembering the more important things are what's going to get you good grades on both my tests, on the pants, and it'll keep you uh, honest when it comes to trying to identify these, um, these deficiencies and syndromes in, in real life when we're seeing our patients in the clinic. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. If not, I'll see you in class. <laughs>